Basically, I'll just talk you through uh, undercover reporting, what it's like um, using some of the stories that I've done over a long period of time. Um, first of all, the basis for it is that in, in a country like the UK, uh, not much of undercover would be needed for almost everything you need. You have access to public information. It's not like that in Nigeria. Um, there exists an FOI law. You know, it was a bill signed into law by former president, good luck Jonathan, in 2012 or thereabouts, um, meaning that Nigerian journalists could just write any government agency, any public institution, and demand information. Um, five years after that law came into existence, an NGO called Media Rights Agenda back in Nigeria did what it called Hall of Shame to say which were the agencies that were disrespecting the law. Guess what? Number one was the Nigerian presidency. The president signed that law. The presidency was the number one violator. Number two, the National Assembly. The people who sat down, brought the law, passed it, were violating it. So it's not a country where you, you need information and then you write the relevant agents. The most basic information, such as what do Nigerian public officials earn, you can't find the answers. You can't write um, the most senior um, Nigerian senator and say, what exactly does the government pay you and expect an answer. So when is undercover reporting justified? When you're aware there's something wrong, you know it's wrong, and then you need evidence, hard evidence. As I said, you are, you are unlikely to get it by asking questions to Nigeria. You have sufficient information to make a story, but you need like visual evidence. Um, you want to write a story and you are trying to experience the pains of the victim. You want to feel what they feel so that you, are, you can put out the story with, with all the passion it deserves. Um, there's clear denial of media access because something suspicious is going on or just because uh, journalists are not allowed to, 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 to enter a, a certain place. Examples of stories that I've done using undercover approach. This is a story about corruption in Nigeria's um, um, importing agency. Now, essentially, you have a situation where if you, let's say, import for just the basis of you know, breakdown. Let's say you import goods worth $100,000. And then the duty that you should pay to the government comes to 10%. Everybody knows it's $100,000. They tell you it's $500,000. And then they tell you you have to pay 10% of that to the government. That's $50,000. So they ask you, just give us, pay $3,000 to a private pocket and you are free. So. You want to abide by the law, but they complicate the process. So you then start to, to wonder, why do I have to pay times five of what is due to government when I can just you know, pay a third of, of the right amount? What I did to uncover the story was that I, I went through the whole process of information, pretended like I wanted to import goods into the country, went to the customs, you know, and we went through the process together. So. I experienced how the system works from start to finish. So rather than ask questions, rather than write uh, the Comptroller General of the Nigerian Customs Service to say, oh, I, I want A, B, C, D, E questions answered. I want one, two, three documents provided. What I did was to simulate the process of importation from start up to the inspection of goods till the very end. So I, I ended up writing you know, a first-hand account of exactly how corrupted the process is. So I got this story because someone who was trying to import a block making machine to the country, you know, faced that roadblock. So with everyday experiences of people, you can get uh, the need to, to go on undercover expeditions. So I was having a conversation with someone that the uh, Luva there is, is familiar with. Uh, you know, so a friend in Nigeria who said she lost her sister in Dubai and 
the way the doctors cared for the body, the, the corpse. She knew that if there was something they could do to keep her alive, they would have done it. But when she lost her mom in Nigeria, it was crazy. They were demanding bribes. You know, mortuary attendants were demanding bribes to take care of uh, dead bodies. So what I did was to pretend like I'd lost someone and I went to mortuaries and cemeteries in Nigeria. I went to two mortuaries and two cemeteries in three states in, in, in Nigeria. Uh, so this was basically about how corruption doesn't only happen with the living, but, but also the dead. This was about IDP camps. Maybe one or two people here are familiar with the insurgency in northeastern Nigeria. It's, it's, it calmed down a bit, but when it was really bad, there were hundreds of thousands of displaced persons all over the northeast, uh, from Borno to Gonbi and all that. And, you know, people were bringing in donations in cash, in goods. The officials manning the IDP camps were the ones, you know, stealing the food that should go to displaced people. Of course, there was no way I would write the, the Borno State State Emergency Management Agency and request information and expect to get it. There was no way I would have access to the displaced people who were mostly uneducated, confined to the camp. So what I did was to pretend like I was a relief agent and I wanted to give relief items to displaced people and they let me in. So by letting me in, I had unfettered access to the displaced people. I could interact with them freely. I saw things, I took pictures, I spoke with camp officials. Um, and then I could come up with a first hand account of what was going wrong in the camp. This is about embarking on basically for, for undercover investigations, the, the ideas come in different ways. So sometimes you're working on one story and then you get leads to, to take on another story. So the story on the left was about probably the most internationally followed abduction on the African continent. 2014, Boko Haram um, attacked a school in a small village in northern Nigeria called Chibok. They got close to 300 girls, took them away. And um, at that time, it was the CNN that made Nigerians understand that the abduction actually happened because the president continued to deny, said his enemies were after him and all that. But Nigerian journalists weren't going to Chibok. So I was the first Nigerian print or online journalist to set foot on Chibok. At that time, the major airport to Meiduguri, that's the capital of the state where Chibok is located, the airport had been closed down because of insurgency. It wasn't safe to land anywhere in that state. So you would have to land in an adjoining state called Yobe, and then have to travel several hours on insurgents infested road to get to Chibok. So I was making that journey, a two day journey. You travel, you know, once it's 4 p.m., it becomes unsafe to travel. If you travel, I mean, back then, now it's much safer. If you travel past 4 p.m., you are risking abduction. So. 4 p.m. we had to stop in a town called Biu and continue the next day. But while on that journey, I you know, came across scores of Nigerian soldiers you know, patrolling the highways. Maybe there's someone here who has been to Nigeria before. Northern Nigeria is extremely, um, the weather is always at its extreme. If it rains, it rains, it gets flooded. If the sun shines, you feel like this is hellfire, like hellfire has, has come to us on earth. So it can shine and you are so hot that you can't go out today. And tomorrow it rains and everywhere is flooded. That's the kind of weather that you have in, in northern Nigeria. So it's not only in the UK where the weather can be a bit, a bit tricky. So it did happen that I saw lots of soldiers in the scorching sun and I thought, oh, oh wow, this is, this is exceptional sacrifice. Does the government take very good care of them. Of course, again, as I said earlier, you're not going to write the Nigerian army and say, I want to see the budget 
for soldiers fighting Boko Haram in the Northeast, and you expect an answer? No. The only way is to go find out, you know. For instance, the first Nigerian soldier, you won't read this in the English, but first Nigerian soldier to, to die in Sambisa Forest. Sambisa is a forest that's big, uh, the size of sometimes two, three states, depending on what states you are looking at. The stronghold of Boko Haram, the first Nigerian soldier ever to die in Sambisa, it wasn't because Boko Haram killed him. It was because he got dehydrated. There was no water. You know, it was that bad that the government wasn't sending... Um, the army authorities were in sending, you know, basic essentials. So, during that journey, I started to think about the plight of Nigerian soldiers. And afterwards, I did this in 2014. Then, two years later, went back to the Northeast and tried to find soldiers. Went to two basic hospitals. There's one hospital called um, Memilari Cantonment in Meduguri, the capital of the insurgency you have a hospital where soldiers freshly injured on the battlefield get taken so that they can be stabilized. And then those who require complicated surgeries are then sent to another state in called Kaduna uh, 44 military hospital. I needed to be inside those two hospitals to see how soldiers were sacrificing their lives and had been injured on the battlefield to see how the government was taking care of them. So. For the first hospital, I had to disguise, I had to pretend like I was um, a domestic aide to a woman who had access to the hospital. So I just held a bag and I went in and I spent, you know, time there. Um, something similar for the second hospital. But what did I find out? I found soldiers who had been abandoned by the government. The one on the right got shot while defending his boss during the Boko Haram attack. And for 44 months, all he needed was a prosthesis. You know, and the government, you know, never gave him. But it's not the kind of story you are able to unearth without going undercover. At another hospital, I found out that this picture is not so clear because it was, you know, undercover filming. But you have soldiers who, if you can see that white site in the middle, that's the site of a bandage. That's a soldier nursing a gunshot wound, and is in a room that is hot and experiencing power outage and there is a generator that should service the building that hasn't been fueled because someone somewhere decided to keep the money in their pockets and he had to resort to using a hand fan to you know get himself comfortable it's not what you would find out and of course it's a restricted zone it's military zone you can't you know, find a story like this without, you know, without experience, without um, using this guy's tactic. I dressed for undercover investigation during, during individual um, living. So I was based in Lagos at the time, and then I got another job. Lagos is the commercial um, uh, capital of Lagos. I got a job in the federal capital, and then my first road trip, I saw lots of uniformed men who were supposed to secure the country, but were just busy t taking bribes from motorists. So if you stole a car, you got away with it. If you were um, drunk and you were driving, you got away with it. Uh, so basically what I, what I did was to note every checkpoint. I passed through 86 checkpoints. Um, a journey of more than, uh, I have to check the story again to check. This is like a 2018 story. But I remember 86 checkpoints over a very, a two day journey. And I wondered if a car was stolen, the state would be in, there would be no documents, no driver license, no authorization. Threw all the documents away, you know, tried to simulate that a car was stolen. And then I drove from Lagos to Abuja and back to Lagos and um, nobody took the car. There were three or four stops. Uh, what they did was to collect money from me and set me going. As a matter of fact, one policeman you know, apprehended me and said he was sure I stole that car. I couldn't be driving the car without any documents. I definitely stole it. You know, but he asked for bribes and we negotiated and it was 80,000 error. 
and then we beat it down to $20,000. Maybe someone can do a pound conversion and see how you know, small a figure it was. And then this policeman went on to tell me, so while we were negotiating, I got to a point where I said, so what happens if you take all this money from me and this is just like the start of the journey? How, how do I survive the entire journey? And his advice was, when next you get stopped at the checkpoint, just lie to them that you were robbed and all the card documents were taken away from you. Coming from so you're someone who should, who should enforce uh, the law. This was about defending the rights of people who don't get counted as deserving. Um, it's a psychiatric hospital where human beings get treated like shit, like animals, you know, just because they have some mental disorder or they, have, they, are, they are struggling with substance abuse. And um, it was an insider who alerted me to, to the challenge in the hospital. And I remember saying that we could get the story written via two approaches. I called one the Indomie approach. I called one the fried rice approach. Indomie is there's a problem, and it's been reported to a journalist. You speak with the person, say, what are the issues? You note them down. You call the other side, say, there are allegations about how you run your system. What do you have to say? And there's a response, and then you file the story. But I thought, rather than just listen to, write a third party account of, of the complaint, why not experience it myself? So I met up with a psychiatric doctor. We, you know, planned how to get in, how the questions that doctors at the psychiatric hospital would ask me to, and he explained that they would grill me for about an hour, an hour and a half. And all the questions, they only wanted to arrive at one of three conclusions. One, this guy needs admission, but not drugs. This guy needs admission and drugs. This guy does not need admission. And it was literally a life and death matter because once you get admitted to the hospital, you can't say you don't, you, you don't want to use their drugs. You can't say you don't want to use their injection. They have a group that they call crisis. If you're a patient at the hospital, they pin you down and they force you to take your drugs. If you should take injections and you don't want to, they pin you down, they inject you. So remember, I, I was just a journalist. I had no, I had no um, psychiatric issue, but I needed to be in to experience first and some of the complaints that you know, had been fed. So yeah, eventually went in, faced a doctor, um, and then the conclusion was this guy needs admission, but he doesn't need drugs, he doesn't need injections, let's have him. And that enabled me to spend 10 days in that psychiatric hospital um, to experience things firsthand. And basically, it was clear that, particularly for the drug patients, the, the hospital was trying to take drugs from them, but did not replace with anything. You can't, you can't take drugs from someone and then you, don't give, the, you give the person terrible food, like food that uh, nobody should, even animals should not eat. But they could get away with it. Again, the, one of the biggest justifications for undercover um, reporting, which uh, I know is controversial, one of the biggest justifications is that secrecy is one of the main drivers of impunity. Just that understanding that in this kind of setup, there is no way anyone is going to know what is happening here. Like, how? If you're not a psychiatric patient, how do you get to see what's happening in a psychiatric hospital? So, if you are in a Nigerian prison and you are not a prisoner, how do you get to know? You can only rely on hearsay. Someone somewhere, an ex inmate saying stuff, but you can't report live from the prison because how is it going to happen? So, from my experience, the, some of the biggest stories that I've covered, probably the biggest of them is this. What I found out was the, the feeling, the understanding by those who abuse power that here, we are the all in all, whatever happens here stays here, nobody gets to know, no media gets to report it, we get away with it. Now, um, so for, for, for journalists who've, who have wanted to do undercover um, reporting and the complaint has always been how do they start 
I like to say that when you do smaller ones for a while, you build an investment bank, and then people trust you with some of the biggest stories that they think you can unearth. Um, this came from someone who had been to, who did some bad business, got remanded temporarily in prison, and came out and told me back in 2016 that a lot was happening in Nigerian prisons if I managed to get in. So it took me three years of, you know, psyching myself up. I don't know what prisons are like in the UK. I haven't been to one. But trust me, a Nigerian prison is not where you want to spend a few hours. <laughs> mm? A Nigerian police station is not where you want to spend a police cell. It's not where you want to spend 30 minutes. Yeah. So what's the capacity of this room? Does anyone know the capacity of this room? How many people can be sat here at once? Let me try. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So how many rows do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 20 times. So it's like 340. Now, let's assume this is a Nigerian prison. 3,400 people will be in this room. And they have to sleep. So how you sleep? You don't sleep like this. You don't sleep face up, face down. That's too much space for one person. You sleep this way. You know, you sleep with your side on the floor. There is no space to roll to on the left, on the right. It's that bad. So um, what I did, because again, as I said, I couldn't write the prison authorities, write the, 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 com the inspector general of police for information. What I did was then to pretend like I had committed a crime. Um, so got someone from my team to go file a complaint against me at the police station, and then they came to pick me up. There was no investigation, nothing. They just came, picked me up, and then <coughs> took me to the police cell. What we said, my offense was that I had bought a car worth 2.8 million naira. I paid 500,000 naira. There was a deficit of 2.5 million, and I did not, you know, I was evading um, the person who sold the car to me. That's the official complaint. And then to make it, to give it some semblance of criminality, he then said that I had issued a dot check to him. So, you know, someone in Nigeria who had relocated to the US, who was a banker, we got, you know, her checkbook, you know, tore one of them, wrote on it, and the bank on that checkbook had a branch less than one kilometer from that police station. They never went there to say, hi, did you ever get this check? Did anyone present? There was no investigation, you know, and, and, and the, the problems of the Nigerian criminal justice system are so many that if I don't like your face, I can get you to prison. If I look at James, I say, well, why are you looking at me like that? I'm going to send you to Nigerian prison. I can. And guess what? I only need to go to the police and give them some money. Maybe in British currency, maybe five pounds, 10 pounds. So I want to send James to prison. James did A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, do you have James's address? Yes. They go to his house, they pick him, they take him to police cell, write a statement. From police cell, they take him to court. From first day in court, the case only gets mentioned. It doesn't get heard. It only gets mentioned. And then the magistrate says, oh, based on these accusations, these are the bail conditions. So you, James, go to prison until you meet your bail conditions. So James will get out because he has done nothing wrong. But because I don't like his face, he gets to spend time in prison. One night, two nights, three nights, depending on the kind of lawyers he has and how quickly they can perfect his bail conditions. You know, you can, you can get anyone to, to prison. They get out, but they get there first. And I thought that was really bad. And that's what we saw because there was no investigation. They picked me up, put me in a police cell. Remember, the plan was to go to prison. I had no business with the police. The pitch for this story, I titled it Reverse Prison Break. <laughs> you know, people in prison want to come out. I wanted to break into prison. I titled it Reverse Prison Break. I had no business with police. The police was just an avenue to get to prison. By Nigerian laws, 
if you arrest a suspect for a case that is not murder related, you have to arrange them in court within 24 hours. However, if the nearest court is more than 100 kilometers away from that police station, you have the grace of an extra 24 hours. So they had no basis to keep me for more than 48 hours. Day one, they came in the morning. Is there anyone to come and you know, pay, get your bill? They wanted money. I said, no. Day two, I said, no. It was a Monday morning. So mon Tuesday morning, I said, nobody. Wednesday morning, I said, nobody. There were two young girls who would come to see me in prison. They had spy camera. They would film what was happening. They would bring me food. And they had to pay the police to get the food across to me. Pay the police sometimes more than the cost of the food that they were bringing to me. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the head of the station said, look, this guy doesn't have money. Let's take him to court. And if so belatedly, after five nights in the police cell, I got to court on Friday. In court, people close to the magistrate, someone close to the magistrate came to me and said, look, if you would pay us a certain amount of money, I didn't put that in the story for a certain reason, you will sleep in your house tonight. Meaning that sometimes, and that's one of the, the beauties of undercover reporting, there are things that, you know, in theory look, speak and span, but with undercover you can expose them. So someone gets sentenced to court in Nigeria, oh, remanded in prison, on the, and you say, yes, justice has been done. Meanwhile, someone went to him behind and said, give us some money and you go to your house. And that's what they wanted to do with me. A pronouncement in an open court that I was to be remanded in prison, but here I was being presented with the opportunity to go sleep right back in my house. But because my target was prison and not the police, I re rebuffed the offer. And when I got to prison, what did I find out? Found drug abuse, sodomy, bribery, pimping. Basically, if you have money, apart from loss of freedom, you get to live your normal life in a Nigerian prison. If you want to have sex, you do. If you want to have drugs, you do. If you want whatever, um, if you want to speak with people, that's why you would, you would read the parts of someone currently in prison orchestrating another crime from prison. How? Not being part of, being the one, you know, being the ringleader orchestrating another crime. Because in prison, even though you should have, prisoners should have no access to phones, you find out that Nigerian prison warders are the ones who collect the phones, take a bribe, and then pass the phone on to inmates. Or if your phone is worth 100,000, they bring it to inmates, they want to sell at times three, times five the price. So I have Nigerian prison inmates that I chat with that are on Twitter, they're active on Twitter. You will know. You see a tweet, you don't know it's from a Nigerian. <laughs> You know, it's from a prison dungeon, you know, all because of the kind of corruption that happens in prison. But again, there is no way you are ever finding out without spending time in prison yourself. I was in prison for eight days, you know. The Nigerian law states that if you have been convicted, you cannot hold political office. I need to check again, maybe for 10 years or forever. But you can erase your record from, from prisons. You just need to speak with, oh, yes, you go into prison and then you see the right people and your record gets taken away. And this is so easy to prove. During COVID, there was a time, there was a jailbreak in some Nigerian prisons, eh? two of them. I remember one in Edo State. And the Nigerian prison service, you know, sent out a desire of the inmates that had escaped. For some of them, they had no pictures. They had names, but no pictures. But as one who has spent time in a Nigerian prison, I can tell you that that should never happen because you go to multiple layers of recommendation. You get in, you fill a form physically, they take your passport, they print it, they affix it to a page, you sit down before a computer, they take another shot, they capture you electronically. So you go through documentation twice. There is no basis for not having a record of the online documentation and then the record of the physical documentation. It's because the records were erased, simple. So there's almost nothing that can't happen in a Nigerian prison. There was someone who was in prison who was supposedly in prison, but was sleeping in hotels and would come to the prison on the eve 
or the morning of his court trial. You know? And the people against whom we had a case will get to court and think, oh, justice is being served. After all, he doesn't have his freedom. So, sometimes you employ undercover when your country needs you. Maybe one or two people here are aware that there was a massive protest in Nigeria in 2020 called NSAS. And I supported that protest, one, because of my experience in, in police cell and prison. By the way, something very instructive that I forgot to tell you is also about how I discovered how the police trump up charges against people. Remember I said I went in claiming that I had bought a car and did not complete the payment. Now, there was this day I wanted to have my bath in the police cell. It was evening. And a woman, you know, was taking over the shift from her colleague. And, you know, the gates of the cell are always locked. So I signaled to her that I needed her to open the, the gate of the cell so I could get water and have my bath. And the woman said, wait till me your name. That's what's your name? So I used a pseudonym called Ojo Olajumoke because that's the name on the check that we had access to that we were going to present. And then the woman said, Ojo Olajumoke. So for every police cell, you have a board that contains the names of suspects, people who have been locked up in the cell, and their offenses. And the woman looked and said in pigeon, your offense, no rich make you bath. With your offense, you shouldn't be having a bath. And I was stunned, looked at a fellow suspect and said, please, what is, because I'm, I'm short-sighted, I didn't have my glasses. So please look at that board. What's my offense? I, have, I haven't committed murder. Why, why can't I have a bath in, in cell? And the guy looked, and what had been written against my name was stealing and hijacking of SUV. So I had experienced first and how the police would trump up charges against people. So when there was widespread protest about um, the high-handedness of a section of the Nigerian police called SAR, Special Anti-Robbery Squad, I knew I had to support it. Special Anti-Robbery Squad. In prison, I found a, a guy who had committed fraud. And he said, in a particular state, if you choose to commit cybercrime, you have to find the most senior officer in the special anti-robbery squad and present yourself to him and pay him a monthly bribe. And they would never come after you. So it actually was that bad. Now, for this story, there was, after the protest, people were killed, yes, and then there were arguments in Nigeria about whether those guys were killed or not, and then big arguments, you know, friends became enemies because one thought nobody was killed, another one thought some people were killed, and then there was a third group that felt, yes, people were killed, but the number of the diseased, the number wasn't high enough to qualify as a massacre. So I had to you know, employ undercover tactic as part of my means because I, I did feel that it was, it was an urgent national question that a journalist needed to try to answer. This is about how in Nigeria, you know, religion is used to strip people of their, of their wealth. Prophets who would claim to have seen the future, to have seen what will happen to you in three years, in five years, in ten years, would want to collect money from you. You know, um, the real genesis was that there were claims that pastors and imams were trying to forcefully convert LGBT um, LGBT plus Nigerians to street, in quotes. And then what I did was present myself to churches like I was gay, you know, and it was just a social analysis. They just looked at me and thought, you know, with my appearance, um, I should have had a picture of, I, I did a disguise, I, I changed my looks into dread, I painted my lips black. I basically tried to alter my most prominent um, facial features. But because I painted my lips black, they thought, I smoked a lot, smoked a lot of cigarettes, a lot of hemp, I drank irresponsibly. And then they gave me all these prophecies and said those were my problems. You know, said I slept with dogs, with animals, with men in my dreams. A lot of nonsense, you know, predicted my future. You know, one even said, oh, the work you are doing now, continue after a while, after some years, 
you know, you have the grace to start out on your own. At the time she was saying that I had been on my own for at least two years, you know. But basically, just to, you know, religion is a very touchy subject in Africa. You don't just, you don't just speak in, against the man of God. But when you go in and you have video and audio, you know, um, backup of the things that you've seen, it becomes difficult for anyone to, to rubbish the work that you've done. People often, you know, wonder what the best technique is. If I had time, I would have said, I would have wanted us to, to guess, but I'll quickly go through this. There's hidden camera with which you capture things that show the story you're trying to uncover. Then you have your eyes, you have your memory, you have words used graphically. Um, most important, the eyes, because nobody can take your eyes away from you. What you see while being undercover is constant, followed by your memory, you know, seeing things and storing them up in your memory. There is a, there is a story that I consider one of the finest pieces of journalism to come out of Africa of all time. The title is Europe by Desert, Tears of African Migrants. If there is someone who is interested in checking data, you can. Europe by Desert, Tears of African Migrants. It was written by a journalist called Emmanuel Meyer. In the era when maybe 2010, 11, 12, no pictures, no videos, but with the story was so graphically written that you knew it went to those places. It would mention a, a building and it would mention a church adjacent that building, mention a bank opposite that building. You know, so it's not like he just sat down somewhere and created a story because nobody could, you know, see those things. You could pick up his piece and go back and trace that story. And you would see that he went to all those places because all those landmarks were there, you know, sites and then you know, the presence of mind to store them in your memory. After that, you then have your hidden camera because you prove. Some people think the camera is like the most important, but definitely not. Because journalism is not access to information. It is what you do with the information you have access to. And that's the difference between blogging and journalism. Any blogger can have access to any information. But what do you do? Do you copy and paste? Do you process? Do you dig deeper? Do you find more sources? Do you, do you track data? Yeah, so most important, your eyes, anyone who can concentrate can do undercover journalism. Just getting access to where you need to, being focused enough, knowing to, if I were to write a story on my presentation, I would come in and I would talk about the number of rows that you have, um, how for the first row you have two spaces in between, the color of the chairs, how people are sat interspersed, you would... I would take you into this auditorium. You would feel like you are here, even though you aren't. And that's also the importance of words used graphically. But you can only call on your stolen telling power if you took time to see everything you should see and to store them in your memory. In prison, at some point, my cover was blown. So they took away the... We, we did have to play a psychological game. So... I want, they found a hidden camera on me and I wanted to de-emphasize that camera. And I told them, look, what's, what's in the camera? What I see is the most important thing because that's what nobody can take away from me. And from the moment I said that, they, restricted, they put two inmates on me and said I couldn't go anywhere without one of them <laughs> you know, following me. Yeah, so this story I was talking about the other time. Euro by Desert, Tears of African Migrants, migrant, the power of writing and storytelling, we, you know, when it is graphic. How far can an undercover journalist go as far as the story demands? If the methodology is not criminal, the project is clearly being undertaken in the public interest. With undercover, the most important thing is the public interest. And the biggest question is, which is more important? My method of getting a story or the public interest being abused by lack of understanding? Lack of awareness about the problem. Which is more important, that I change my name because someone said at the time that I had committed a crime. As a matter of fact, the Nigerian prison wanted to prosecute me for espionage, for this, for that, and they said, oh, I, I took on another person's identity. Which is more important, that I am Fisai or Shoyombo and I claim to be Ujola Jumoke. Is that more important than an ex-convict being able to hold public office against the law? Is that more important than someone committing 
big time fraud, sleeping in his house while the public think he's in prison. So it's always about the, ex the scale of public interest is what should determine the methodology, as long as the methodology is not criminal. Yes, I took on another identity, but I didn't commit any crime with it. I didn't actually go to that bank account of Ojola Jumoke to withdraw money. You know, so as long as the method is not criminal, as long as, again, you know, one of the reasons of other cover is that people try to link it to, to entrapment. As long as there is no entrapment. I didn't go to the police to say, lock me up and take bribes from me and take me to court and tell the people in court to ask me for bribes so that I can sleep in my house. No. All I did was present myself. So if the police did their job, when we present, the complainant presented me as having committed a crime, if they went to the bank, that would have been the end. To say, we've gone to the bank, we can't find any evidence that this guy did anything wrong, so you are free. So as long as there is no entrapment, the methodology is not criminal, the public interest is being protected, then the fact that a story is undercover, does it damage the credibility of the journalist? I think no. Um, if the work is a lot more than this guy's, the quality of journalism would shine through. The risks, I'm running through them now because we're running out of time. Um, the government would, surely if in Nigeria, they would deny the matter, you know, they, you have the hard facts, but their, their first response is to deny, is to kick back. But when you have your facts, the public know that they're lying. They question your motive, they try to harass you. you, you sometimes you are threatened with death. I can't count how many death threats I've received. The last person to send me a death threat, I replied him, that you will die before me. So I'm, I'm used to getting death threats. It's no longer a big deal. Sometimes it gets circled. We had an exchange. Like we, sp we exchanged like four emails. <laughs> so don't think because they are threatening me, then I'm going to hide the work order. Everybody gets to die at, the, at, at some point. So <laughs> you can't threaten me with a, a basic fact of life. Birth and death are constants in life. Whether you, you take up undercover journalism or not, you, you don't get to live. Nobody gets out of here alive. No, out of this auditorium, people get out alive. <laughs> Don't be scared. But nobody is living this life alive. So an example of where, you know, we, the, the, the story about IDP camps, the state government, the, the Nigerian army released a statement to say, oh, what had committed was subversion in military crimes that's punishable with death. <coughs> Never mind that after releasing this statement, that first soldier that I said 44 months of not having a prosthesis, they gave him a prosthesis. Lots of soldiers who had suffered hearing aid that suffered hearing aid, not because Boko Haram shot at them. No, because Boko Haram shot around them. Boko Haram had anti-aircraft gun to shoot. And Nigerian soldiers were going about with Kalashnikov. So those around in vicinities where Boko Haram shot, AAG lost their hearing aids. And just to give them, you know, they lost their sense of hearing and the government didn't give them hearing aid. But after my story, they did. This was when I could have been... I could have been caught in the bomb blast. Uh, this was when some soldiers found me out and questioned me. Um, I spoke about the risk of psychological trauma. Um, for the IDP story, the president, then president of Nigeria, admitted that there were problems. You know, the story was brought to his attention and he said he was going to act on it. Unfortunately, he fell ill. I'm sure people here know that our president spent quite a lot of time, you know, in the UK than in Nigeria in 2017, 18, or thereabouts. So yeah, the risk is worth it. Another case with the custom story, the custom tried to, you know, do some probe. And why I said the risk is worth it, this is my, my happiest moment in journalism till date. There is no award that I've won. This is the soldier. I showed you at the start who, who had lost his leg and then they amputated it and didn't give him a prosthesis. So after my story, they gave him a prosthesis. As a result of my, my work, he could walk again. When I met him, his wife was pregnant, heavily pregnant. She was taking care of herself, the baby and the one-legged husband. But after my story, he got an artificial leg. A Nigerian um, former minister read the story, sent the wife money to start a business. So for me, the biggest thing about undercover reporting is that because it uncovers the biggest, probably the most heartbreaking stories, there is a very high chance um, for impacts. 
It doesn't always happen that every story you write becomes impactful. But for me, I say that I would write nine non-impactful investigations and still go on the 10th. Because if I get impact from the 10th story, it covers for all the 10 stories that I've, that I've done. I mean, the, I, it's just sheer fulfillment knowing that just because I did a story, this, this guy, you know, ended up working again after 44 months. That's like almost four years of not having a leg. Thank you. I'll take questions. Yes, um, the more you do undercover reporting, the more you get known. So in the past, I could just get up and go to any location and get my story done. Now, I have to first alter my looks. So that, that doesn't stop me, but it makes it more uncomfortable. So when I'm on a story, I change my looks, then I get a hood to cover it up so that my new looks don't become public. So you, you don't get to see it. It means that when I'm then at the scene of a story, it's a new look, it's an unknown look, it's hard for people to recognize me. So the whole process of I've altered my looks, I have a hood, I want to leave my house, I first have to make sure that I'm covered. I go out and I'm coming in and once I'm approaching my house, I have to put my hood on again to cover it up. I'm in my office. My colleagues don't, don't see me, you know, in that undercover look. I mean, I'm in the office and then even if it's hot, I still need to have that hood on. So, yes, it complicates things because I need to invest more effort in making sure that no one picks my face when when I'm working. Meanwhile, in the past, I, I didn't need to do that. One of, also, one of what I've also mm. done is to start an organization in Nigeria called Foundation for Investigative Journalism, FIJ, you know, trying to build a new army of young minds who can also do this, which means that a few years down the line, if I decide not to again, there are still people who, who, who do it. It's, it's both making sure I can still do it, but having a plan for when I will no longer be able to do it.